This morning's sermon's titled, Mama Peg Moran, <clears throat> Mother's Day Lesson 2022. <clears throat> Peg Moran, who is she? Well, she was born uh, into a slave family in Loudoun County, Virginia, which you have over here, in 1764. She was a light-skinned Cameroonian. And her fair complexion tended to generate favoritism by masters, landing her in the position of a house slave, which was an acceptable practice of that day. And then when she was 20 years old, she was sold to a new master, Richard Chichester. That was over in Farquhar County in 1784. And there she served as the house servant. He likely assigned Peg as a house slave. Being a master, he could do whatever he wants with his property, including her. As was common in those days, she caught the forceful eye of her master. And in a short time, she was expecting child. Never mind that this uh, man, uh, Richard Chichester, had a wife and children. She became a mom against her will. And in 19, or 1787, she became the mother of a mixed child, William Moran. And though she might not have had much choice in the matter, she still loved just like a mother would, following the precedent set forth by the mother of all living, which is what Eve means. Moms love their kids. The relationship seemed to have continued. And the reason we know that, based on research, is that she had two more sons with the master over the years. And she had four other children with an unknown father as well. And uh, not much is known about Peg Moran, other than she died in 1824, was buried somewhere on the plantation. We do know some other things, though. There's robust information that one can deduce things that might describe how Mama Peg carried herself. It appears that Peg modeled a great example of motherhood to her master, for his heart softened over time and she was no longer a slave in his eyes. Because what we found out is she was considered the model matriarch of the slave community that was there. And just like the grandmother and mother of Timothy modeled examples of Christ to the young man, 2 Timothy 1.5, it appears that Peg was an influence for the future of her children as well. Official documents, official documents that you can see right here, and you can see why it took so long. You have to go through a lot of documents, research things at state websites. According to the... Um, uh, free Negro documentation from the Virginia Commonwealth, we found out that William Moran was freed at the death of his master. And not only that, so was Peg, and so was all her children. He was freed as part of a tribe of called Bright Mulattoes. And not only that, this mixed child of a white master received a double portion and 35 acres in the will to take care of his mom. On behalf of her descendants, I'd like to wish Peg Moran a happy Mother's Day, Mama Peg Moran. To work in those dire circumstances and to win over the heart of a master to where he actually excluded his white biological children, all but one, and gave the double portion to his mixed son through Peg Moran. But then William Moran, what did he do with his life? Well, because William inherited land. He spent the rest of his life in farming, and though he was a slave, he was still not permitted to have an official government-recognized marriage. He had a, what was called a jump-in-the-broom ceremony. And he chose for his mate 
Sarah Sally Mann. She was also a freed slave who was light-skinned, who was 15 years his junior. And so uh, the children are considered like arrows in the hand of a warrior. How blessed is the man who has a quiver full of them. Uh, Psalm 127.5, Sally understood this to a large extent, bringing forth 12 children with him over the next 14 years. And the eldest being Mary Jane Mann, born in 1819, as we have documentation here. And uh, talk about a quiver full of arrows, 12 kids in 14 years, and not one of them was twins. I mean, that woman was given birth. William remained married to Sally for the next 29 years. She remained married to him for the next 29 years after his death. She passed from tuberculosis on the safe, same land for which she served on a plantation, and there she was buried. Mama Peg would have been proud of her daughter-in-law because she taught her well. And on behalf of the daughter-in-law, Sally, I think it could be said, Happy Mother's Day, Mama Peg Moran. Mary Jane Mann, what did she do? Mama Peg's granddaughter, the oldest one, Mary J. Mann, would have also had a hard time taking the matriarch mantle, even though she was considered a free, bright mulatto. According to the laws of that time and location, she was still considered having slave blood in her veins. Having to take her mother's slave surname, she was limited to finding a mate in the general area of the plantation. This is leading up to the Civil War. You just didn't walk around as a mixed person you could be in trouble. So her candidates for marriage were slim. She ended up marrying her uncle. And uh, uh, at age 15, in 1835, she began a relationship with another freed slave, her uncle, Thomas Moran. Over the next 14 years, God blessed them with 12 children. And uh, one of them bore her name that she was very proud of. Her name was Mary Jane Moran. Because her uncle was a freed slave, she could take that name. Titus th uh, 2, 3 through 5 reminds us that older women are to set an example for godliness for the younger women. And it appears that this was taught in this family. You see, she lived a widow her last 16 years, dying on June 1st, 17, or 1895. That if you look at Mary Jane Moran, she was with her son, Lucien. And I look at the records of where people lived. Families just took up entire blocks. And you would see aunts and uncles, just like you have Mary Jane Moran being taken care of by her son. You see a lot of these elderly aunts and grandparents living with their kids, all under one roof. They stuck together as a family. And, and I think... We're told in 1 Timothy 5, verse 8, but if anyone does not provide for his own, especially those of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Apparently, this lesson was instilled in the hearts and minds of her kids. And to this, I think that Mary Jane Moran can say to her grandmother, thank you, Mama Peg Moran. Happy Mother's Day. You know, one of the kids, the youngest one of the children of Mary Jane Moran, her name was Kitty, Kitty Gaines. Let me sc scroll through this. Kitty Gaines, this is her right here. 
She was born in 1867, just after the Civil War. And there was never a time more turbulent for anyone to do with the slave population than around that time. And so, being the youngest child born, she lost her father figure at a young age. James 1, 26 and 27 advises Christians to look after their widows and orphans, for these are the most vulnerable of society. And in Kitty's case, not having a father, she ended up uh, uh, becoming a bit of a rebel mom. She latched on to a married philandering descendant of slaves named Robert Buck Buchanan. He was married, he philandered, he was a drunk. He was actually, he was actually in 1890 taken to trial for killing his own brother in self-defense, stabbing him in the femoral artery. This guy was, was a pretty bad dude. And this is who her love interest was. She saw, uh, he sired six illegitimate children with her including Mary Catherine Gaines in 1890. And even though her children were illegitimate in the eyes of the government, she loved them just as any mother would. When the relationship with Buck ended at the turn of the century, she moved west from the slave community that her people came from and went and lived with one of her daughters near Cleveland, Ohio. She passed away in 1954 and buried just outside of Cleveland. And uh, uh, here's, here's the documentation where she lived with her daughter, Irene. And uh, she never had a stable life by any means. It appeared that her children were her life, just like the matriarch Peg Moran. And even though Kitty was a bit of a rebel, even Kitty can say, Happy Mother's Day, Mama Peg Moran. She was the matriarch. Mary Catherine Gaines, the one whom she gave birth to in 1890. One of Kitty's daughters, she stayed in the ancestral location where Mary uh, uh, was born. She was one of the few that actually stayed in that area. Well, she, recognized as mulatto by the local government, was not allowed the full freedoms of being white. She married a cousin who was 26 years her senior, William Jackson, right there. He married her, 26 years older. He was also descendants of slaves. And they lived near, the whiter you were, the closer you could live to the white population. And so you could actually track and see the population because there was so much division at that time that uh, you could tell just by where city center was and how close it was to a white population if you were even allowed to move into a neighborhood. And so over the course of 29 years of marriage, she would give birth to nine children with William Ernest Jackson, the eldest, born in 1912. She worked as a laundress to supplement her income. And uh, she still had time to raise her kids, be a good wife, be involved in her church family. Proverbs 31, 10 through 31 uh, tells us some of the virtues of the virtuous woman. Something which Mary Catherine strived and appeared to be in her life as a mother. She became a widow in 1940, and only weeks after she lost her husband, with World War II approaching, her two sons, she signed the documentation for their draft, not draft papers, but to enlist, so her only two sons were enlisted in uh, the service. And uh, you could tell she was a good mom. This right here is her son, uh, Melvin C.T. Uh, Jackson. He was a Tuskegee Airman 
died a decorated major and buried in Arlington. So they were very patriotic too. And um, she lived a long life of great sacrifice for her children from the moment they were born to her dying breath, passing away in Florida in 1984. It appears that uh, she learned a lot as passed down through the generations. And for that, Mary Catherine, it appears another reason she could wish Happy Mother's Day, Mama Peg Moran. What about Ernest Jackson? Well, her son, not long after the death of his father, with the blessing of his mom, William Ernest, who was already in the service before World War II, he married Jane Elizabeth Jackson in Washington, D.C. And this photograph captures the joy of William Ernest and his wife and his mom down in Florida because the mom went down to Florida to be with the daughter. And he had a new chapter in his life. He was wounded over the loss of his dad, but now he has a wife. And not long after they were married, Jane Elizabeth uh, would be expecting child. She gave birth. They resided in Washington, D.C. with a new future. James 4.14 says, What is your life? is even a vapor. It appears for a little time, then vanishes away. And in this case, um, just like so many of Peg Moran's descendants, tragedy would strike again. For Jane Elizabeth would die unexpectedly at age 24, and their daughter Shirley was only one year old. She would painfully lose the joy of motherhood just as it was beginning. Because the United States was just pulled into World War II, William Ernest, he was then sent overseas. So he adopted their child out to the grandparents and, um, because he couldn't take care of the child and he had to go serve the country. He, after the war was done, William Ernest traveled to see his daughter, but largely due to racial hatred, the grandfather did not allow the mulatto father to see his young daughter. He returned back to his home area in Virginia to a shortened life of alcoholism. He died in 1977, having never seen his daughter again. The matriarch Pe Peg Moran could relate to loss as a mother, for some of her children were relocated through slavery. Some died without burial, never to be seen again. There were broken hearts going all over back then. And to this, once again, they could wish a well-deserved Happy Mother's Day, Peg Moran. Shirley Jane Jackson, William Ernest's daughter, grew up, graduated high school. She married in 1962, had three children of her own. And like all mothers, things do not turn out with ease. Shirley's marriage ended, resulting in her raising the children alone, just like Mama Peg Moran. And now she has, uh, through, through great trial, hard work and enduring spirit of many other mothers, she is now has numerous descendants of her own. Luke recorded in Acts 2, 37 through 39. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, repent, and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises unto you, to your children, and all that be afar off, as many as the Lord God will call to himself. The most important historical fact of Shirley Jane Jackson her life is that in 2017, 
after living five decades plus as a mother, she was baptized into Christ by me, her son. And she received the greatest promise ever afforded humankind. And that's eternal life. She's watching this morning from a hospital room. But I want you to meditate on four facts. Here's my DNA chart right here. Four facts we should embed in our mind. Number one, we're all related. All mankind comes from Adam and Eve. If I spent the rest of my life backtracing all of our DNA, we're going to go back to Adam and Eve. I had no idea I was 4% African and my mom was 6% African on her test. No idea. I learned all this. That's why I invested so much time to understand it. We're all related. Second, we should focus on the connections, not the differences. Being brothers of another mother is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. We should not focus on what makes us different, but on our common creator, who saw all this and sees all these connections. Number three, we all have issues to overcome in life. Anyone can literally chart out their DNA and see stories of people who had to overcome. If you haven't had to overcome anything yet in this life, buckle your pew belt. It's going to get bumpy. You will have to overcome tragedy in your life. We need to accept it, move forward, as the Bible says, press on towards the mark of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. We do the best we can with what we're dealt with. Just like Mama Peg Moran did. And number four, we all ultimately overcome in Christ. Life isn't fair not fair at all, but I'm talking about this life. But eternal life, there's nothing more fair. Fair Lord Jesus. That we all have equal access to the promises. What did Peter say? For this promise is unto you and to your children and all that be afar off. That, that's humankind. So now you know why I wish you a happy Mother's Day to all my matriarchs from my mother, Shirley Jane, to Peg Moran, and all the way back to a common mother, Eve, because that's how God designed it. And I hope maybe this opens your eyes as much as it does my own.